Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, January 29th, 2020. Now, if you've been paying attention to this show for at least a little while now, you know that over the last couple of months, I've spent a lot of time covering problems with most so-called Second Amendment sanctuary resolutions. And a number of people have reached out to me and basically said, Bolden, you know, instead of pointing out all the problems, this is helpful, but instead of just pointing out all the problems, why don't you give us something we can use? Now, setting aside that we do have things that you can use to deal with federal gun control, a lot of people want a resolution, a well-crafted resolution to deal with both both state and federal gun control, because they see this as an important part, an important starting point. And I agree that a well-crafted resolution is a very good starting point. So today, I've got just that. I've got what I see as by far, hands down, the best model Second Amendment resolution for local governments, county, city, whatever, and I'm going to share that with you. I'm also going to go over what I see as four essential foundational points that need to be in a resolution for it to be well crafted. Now, this could apply just to the right to keep and bear arms, or you can use these types of principles for whatever issue is important to you. Now, first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. We have a bunch of live streaming platforms. We are on uh, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, Twitch, DLive. We have archived video versions on Brighteon.com, BitTube.tv, which used to be BitTubers.com. They changed their URL, and BitShoot.com. We also have the audio-only podcast edition, and I'm very grateful for all the reviews that have been coming in over on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google and elsewhere, primarily on iTunes, because that's where we get the most reach. But Spotify is starting to catch up, which is really cool. Find all of our archived episodes, all the ways to follow us, to uh, see the links that I talk about in the show notes, our social media platforms, and you can even support us through our membership program for as little as two bucks a month. Find all of that information, all connecting links and all that stuff over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty, all spelled out. And before getting into all the details, I do want to say hello to my friends out in the live chat. Essential Freedom, Josh Irwin, uh, over on YouTube, Andrew Nappy, good to see you, buddy. Tyler B., Justin Bayola, Richard Kramer, always appreciate your input. Jeremy Anderson, Heather Rossi, Michael Bogus, and Pete Hodgkins on Facebook, Autumn Spring, Dan Warsaw, and every buddy else. And I appreciate Dan stopping by, Suzanne Sperry as well. Dan actually stopped by and said, I don't really have time to watch the live show. Of course, we'll be here later in the archives, but he wanted to stop by and give a thumbs up because Dan knows, as I'm sure many of you know, that literally smashing that like button on whatever platform you're on helps trigger the algorithm of the platform you're on and tells it to show the program to more people. So thank you so, so much. And hello to Dan Reed and Dennis Marburger and everyone else. Thank you so much. Now, before getting to the model resolution, I think it's important to point out a couple of episodes I've done previously in case you may have missed them or if you're new here. First of all, I spent a lot of time talking about the problems in resolutions uh, passed in Virginia, these so-called Second Amendment sanctuary resolutions. I did an episode uh, mid-December, December 18th, Virginia Second Amendment Sanctuaries, Rhetoric versus Reality. If you have not checked out that episode or if you want a refresher, it's a relatively long one, but there's a lot of information in there. And I urge you to check that one out. I will put a link to that in the show notes. And then I also want to make clear, and I know I, I probably don't need to keep saying this, but no matter how many times I do, there are still new people that are coming in and say, well, you may be right about this, this, or this, or maybe I disagree with you on part of it. But in the end, they say, but isn't this still a good starting point? Somehow they've got the view that I'm saying that resolutions are bad all the time because they are non-binding. Mind you, I run an organization that for well over a decade has spent a lot of energy focusing on two of the most famous resolutions passed in United States history, and that would be the Kentucky and v Virginia resolutions of 1798. I talked about those as being a very good starting point just before Christmas. 
On December 23, 2019, resolutions, a starting point for Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and then I also went back to the Revolutionary Times. I could have gone further and talked about Patrick Henry and the resolutions against the Stamp Act, but I did cover John Dickinson, the penman of the Revolution, talking about resolutions being an important starting point, as long as they're well-crafted, of course. So I do want to urge you to check out both of those episodes in case you haven't yet. Now, what makes up for a good resolution? I told you I got four points. Let me check my notes here. First one, it needs to be based on sound principles and your natural right to keep and bear arms. We're not talking about getting permission slips from government. The Second Amendment is not your gun permit. You have the right to keep and bear arms, whether the Second Amendment ever existed or not, or whether they decide to repeal it in the future or not. You, as a human being, have the right to keep and bear arms, to, to defend yourself, to defend your property, to defend your family. And of course, the founders saw the right to keep and bear arms as a way to defend against any type of calls to have large, permanent, standing armies. It's a defense against your own country's potential militarism. And I would, just as a side point, I would argue that because the Second Amendment has not been in full effect since at least 1934. This has been one of the great reasons why we see the U.S. military empire being the largest in the history of the world. So that is incredibly important. We're not basing things on what the Supreme Court has to say. We're not basing things on getting a uh, concealed carry permit, whatever it may be. And this is something that John Dickinson, again, penman of the Revolution, he put it this way. Our liberties do not come from charters, for these are only the declaration of pre-existing rights. Again, the Second Amendment is there to declare pre-existing rights and to prevent the federal government from infringing on those rights or to tell it not to. Of course, words on paper don't actually prevent government from doing anything. That's especially for my ANCAP friends. Number two, it needs to reject all gun control, not some of it, because as soon as you give them an inch, they will take a thousand miles easily. And Thomas Jefferson, and I covered this in the resolutions as a good starting point episode last month, late last year, I guess we can say, Jefferson, after passage of the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798 that he was so instrumental in crafting in secret, sent a copy of them the very day after it was signed by the Kentucky governor. I can't remember, it was Gerard, I believe it was. And he sent this letter to his friend James Madison, who ended up drafting one for Virginia that was passed right around Christmas time in 1798 as well. And you may have heard me say this many times, but I'm going to say it again because it's so important. He said, I enclose you a copy of the draft of the Kentucky Resolves. I think we should distinctly affirm all the important principles they contain. So as to hold to that ground in the future and leave the matter in such a train as that we may not be committed absolutely to push the matter to extremities and yet may be free to push as far as events will render prudent. Jefferson was not talking about some kind of half-assed principles here. He was saying, look, let's talk about our principles. And this is the line in the sand. This is the ground we want to hold to in the future. But we can recognize now that we may, may not get all the way there today. But if we start at a lower point, then you could, that's as far as you're going to get. Or you're going to have to restart or re-explain that now we have new principles. So it's important to point out that all gun control is bad, not just some of it. Third, I think it's important. Excuse me a little bit there. Third, it's important to point out or to make sure that the resolution itself does not confuse the public. It does not claim to be something that it's not. And it's my view, and I think this should be clear by now, especially those who have spent some time listening to me blab on about this, it's my view that calling a Second Amendment or a gun rights resolution a gun rights sanctuary or a Second Amendment sanctuary when it's a non-binding resolution confuses the public. Mind you, I've had so many people reach out to me about this thinking that, well, they've actually created a sanctuary and enforcement is definitely going to stop. Now, mind you, there may be some enforcement discretion from law enforcement officers, but no one is required to stop based on what is passed in the resolution. They are certainly required to stop based on their oath 
to the federal and state constitutions, but they've been enforcing all kinds of violations of both of those constitutions all along. So there's no reason to trust these people. So calling something a sanctuary that isn't actually a sanctuary for marketing purposes, it's either deliberately intended to mislead people into thinking that something more is being done than it is really being done, or someone is so ignorant of what's going on that, um, that it's causing problems. Basically, what's going to happen if people think that there's actually a sanctuary? And I know you and I know that these are not real sanctuaries that have been created, but there are many people in the general public who don't follow this as closely. I hear from them all the time, and they think, and reporters think this too, they think, oh, this local government has created a safe space for gun owners. There are people out there, and that can be problematic. We don't have to use too much of our imagination to understand why calling it something that it isn't is an issue. And my fourth problem, or my fourth main principle, I guess I should focus on the positive here, it needs to be clear in the resolution that the resolution is a starting point, that further action is needed to protect liberty, whether it's on the right to keep and bear arms or something else. So four things, base it on sound principles, reject all gun control, not just some of it, don't lie about what it is, and tell people that more has to be done. So when when more is done, people aren't going to be thinking, well, I thought we just created a sanctuary in my county. What do you mean we have to pass an ordinance now? Or what do you mean we have to change appropriations? What do you mean we have to vote out the sheriff? He already promised that he was not going to enforce it. And the, the resolution said this wasn't going to be enforced. So we want to make very clear that the people know what they're up against, because what we're up against when it, talk, when it comes to the right to keep and bear arms is two major political parties that are absolutely horrible on your natural right to keep and bear arms and have been horrible for a long, long time. Now, bonus, one bonus, fifth point, I don't need to personally agree with every single word in a resolution. There could be some principles that I think are less or more important than another, and those can be in a resolution, and I would absolutely support it if it's based on sound principles along these four essential points. So with that, for those of you who aren't familiar with her, I want to introduce you to someone that I consider a friend. I've never met her in person, but she's been a friend to the Tenth Amendment Center for a long time. Here is a picture, for those of you watching, of Publius Hulda. That's her online pen name. This is Joanna Martin, and this is from some kind of official introduction that I saw. She's a retired litigation attorney and well-known writer and speaker on our Constitution. She has spoke at nullification events for the TAC, I believe, years ago back in Raleigh, maybe Chattanooga as well. She's come and testified in support of bills to create a gun rights sanctuary state in Tennessee and elsewhere. So she has worked with us on a number of issues. We don't always have to agree, but I think we're definitely good allies. Going on, before getting a law degree, she got a degree in philosophy where she specialized in political philosophy and epistemology. She is a former captain in the Army JAG Corps. And she has a really interesting blog, and we've published a number of things from her over uh, the years. Now, going forward, she yesterday, and I didn't even know this was happening, and it's pretty cool because so many people have asked me about this, like, Bolden, you got to come up with something. I'm like, man, this is the time of year where it is almost impossible for me to spend the time needed to draft something new. Usually, because it's state legislative session, it's nullification season for us. Literally, I am barely taking a breath between 6.30 a.m. and 9 p.m., between like a quick lunch break, taking care of my birds, maybe getting into the gym, doing some core exercises because I injured my back in November. Like I am not I am not very flexible in my schedule these days. So I'm like, OK, as soon as I can get to it, maybe it'll be sometime in the spring. But I'm so I should have reached out to Publius before. I don't know why I didn't think of it. But thankfully, she decided to take the issue into her own hands. And yesterday, she released a model resolution for Virginia. Now, I want to go back to the Virginia Citizens Defense League resolution and compare it with what she drafted. And just so you can see, based on those four principles that I'm talking about. First of all, we're, we want to have it based on sound principles, foundational principles. And they do start out positively in the the Virginia Citizens Defense League model resolution for county boards of supervisors. This has been passed by a few dozen counties in Virginia. They start out saying that the, the, they recite the Second Amendment. That's a good starting point. But then they immediately go to 
three different Supreme Court cases. Columbia versus Heller, McDonald versus Chicago, United States versus Miller. Before they even mention the Virginia State Constitution, which George Mason himself was so influential in drafting. Before they get to Article 1, Section 13 of the Virginia Constitution, or the Constitution of Virginia, which is incredibly good on the right to keep and bear arms. So that should be at the top, in my opinion. Not these court cases. I wouldn't even include these court cases because it gives the impression that, okay, well, this is our view of what the court case, and then you're going to spend all this time debating with other people what they think the court case had to say. Or you're empowering the Supreme Court to be the one who decides whether or not you have the right to keep and bear arms. And sometime in the future, maybe long after we're dead, the Supreme Court may take a totally different position. The Constitution means what the Constitution means no matter what the Supreme Court has to say. And I think it is a bad philosophical and strategic choice to rely on the Supreme Court. Now, there weren't really cases to do that with, but Jefferson's Kentucky Res Resolution 1798 didn't talk about court opinions at all, even the full history of law. He didn't cover that. He talked about foundational principles, and you can read that as well. So I have an issue with the fact that they're talking about rights, based on what the Supreme Court had to say. The Supreme Court is unreliable. We can't count on them. On the other hand, this resolution, and I will link to these in the show notes at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. I'm also going to add Publius's model Second Amendment resolution on our legislation page, which is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash legislation sometime later today. So instead of starting out with the Second Amendment, she actually backs it up. And she puts more emphasis, and so do friends like Chris Ann Hall, and I know Bob Brewer, who watches this show very regularly, focus very heavily on the Declaration of Independence. I do not. Maybe I should more, but it isn't as much of a focus. But she goes back right to the Declaration. It starts out. The first two whereas clauses start out with the Declaration of Independence. She says, the Declaration of Independence is the fundamental act of our founding, and recognizes that our rights come from our from the Creator God, and that among these rights is the right of self-defense. Whereas the Declaration of Independence recognizes that the purpose of government is to secure the rights God gave us. So, even if I would change that lightly, the foundation she's talking about is significantly different than, well, the Supreme Court had to say this because the Supreme Court may change its mind in the future, and we also don't want to make people think that our rights exist just because the Supreme Court said them. Our rights exist whether the courts agree with us or not. Then she goes on, and she talks about the Constitution being one of delegated powers. She says, the Constitution of the United States is one of enumerated powers only, and we the people did not grant the federal government any power whatsoever over the country at large to restrict our arms. That couldn't be more straightforward, period. There is no power delegated to the federal government in the Constitution. Then she goes to the Second Amendment, reads the Second Amendment. Then she goes to Article 1, Section 13 of the Constitution of the State of Virginia. She does have on our website, which is her WordPress blog, she has on our website some contact info and actually invites people to contact her to craft it for your specific state. So if you don't live in Virginia, which I'm sure most of you watching or listening to the show do not, you could reach out to her and she would put a custom version of it for your state if you are unable to change that last clause talking about the state of Virginia's constitution. She would look it up for you and include it. But this is very clean. It doesn't have a lot of information in it, but it doesn't need a lot of information. We know that our rights are natural rights. We know that the Constitution was in the Constitution. There was no power delegated to the federal government over arms, period. We know what the Second Amendment says, and we know what Article 1, Section 13 of the Constitution of Virginia has to say. Boom. It's just straightforward. We're not waiting on the Supreme Court to protect us. So that is a very sound foundational start by Publius Holda. And it's not a sound foundational start in almost every other resolution I've seen passed around the country. They all base it on something else, and they mix in some good stuff.
So the second one, it needs to reject all gun control, not just some. And if you go back again to Virginia Citizens Defense League, and I'm sorry to pick on them, they're very good at activism, but they get some of these principles way, way wrong. And this I've called weak sauce. You've heard this before, and I will say it again. This is weak at best. They say, whereas certain legislation that has or may be introduced in the Virginia General Assembly and certain legislation which has or may be introduced in the United States Congress could have the effect of infringing on the rights of law-abiding citizens to keep and bear arms, as guaranteed by the Second Amendment and Article 1, Section 13. I mean, like, we've been living under decades of attacks on the right to keep and bear arms, and they don't even have the backbone to say it? This is as good as we can get? If that's as good as you can get, that some may or may not be violating our rights, may or may not be violating the Second Amendment and the Constitution of this state, if that's as good as you, uh, you're going to reach for, you're always going to get less than that. I mean, that's setting the stage for failure. On the other hand, Publius is, is no joke. She, it, she's already in the whereas clauses, the first one, two, three, four, five, already said the Constitution does not grant to the federal government any power whatsoever to restrict our arms, period. It already says that right off the bat. But then in the resolve section, this is the political statement that goes with it. She says, one, all federal laws, regulations, judicial opinions. Side note, I love that she called it judicial opinions because the Supreme Court, the federal courts, the state courts, they do not make laws. They issue opinions. And it's important to say that they aren't rulings, they are opinions. All federal laws, regulations, judicial opinions, and other e edicts for the country at large which pretend to restrict the people's arms in any fashion whatsoever are unlawful. This is saying all gun control from Washington, D.C. is unlawful. Point two. All state laws, regulations, judicial opinions, and other edicts purporting to apply to the state at large which pretend to restrict the people's arms in any fashion whatsoever are unlawful. There is no wiggle room. There is no analysis that something may or may not. There is no, none at all. This is a very clear statement. Now, if you cannot get your county commission to support this, and I would assume that most will not, the best part of asking them to introduce this is to learn which people are the good guys and are the bad guys. You could change this. If you had to strategically, you could change this to list specific ones that they're willing to do. And that is helpful rather than nothing. But if you're talking about may or may not, that kind of weak sauce garbage, that gets you nowhere. So this, I would really urge people to say, look, I'm not going to go for a Second Amendment or a gun rights resolution unless you're really willing to support gun rights or the Second Amendment. Now, if you just want to target one particular issue, then you have to craft the resolution totally differently to, to make clear that you're only addressing that one issue and that all the other gun control, you're just not going to talk about it right now. You don't want to give people the impression that the only problem are the new bills that are being considered in Virginia or whatever state you may happen to be living in. You don't want to give them that false impression because this is a learning tool. This is an educational piece as well. We want to educate the public. So that's very important. Rejects all gun control and not just some. And then, of course, false advertising. The third one is false advertising. Calling things a sanctuary when they're not. We know that basically everything that's passing, a few hundred around the country already, all these counties are saying, we're a sanctuary. This is very confusing, especially to many people who aren't digging in as deeply as you and I are. And especially in light of the fact that immigration sanctuary cities are so widely opposed. They're not opposed because of their flowery language. They are opposed because they have concrete impact. They have a real concrete impact on the federal government's ability to enforce federal immigration law. You may love it, you may hate it, but that's the fact. And so calling something else a sanctuary to copy that language, but not having an impact on the enforcement of any law is false advertising. I think it is a very, very bad strategy. In fact, I probably wouldn't be as harsh on these resolutions being passed if they weren't calling them Second Amendment sanctuaries. It's such a bad term and it is so misleading. And I think it's going to create a lot of problems for activism in the future. But uh, that's my, my problem. Now, 
Publius doesn't mention anything about a sanctuary. We're not declaring ourselves to be a sanctuary. Let me just see if I can do a, can I do a command F? Sanctuary, nope, doesn't exist. The word sanctuary does not exist in this document. I'm glad it didn't because if it did, we'd have to talk about that as being a problem as well. So she's not claiming that it's something that it's not. They're just taking a position Whoever passes this particular resolution is taking a position that all gun control is illegal, unlawful. All gun control from the feds, all gun control in the state. Now, if you're in California, it's going to be harder to make that argument on the state level against the state constitution or in Illinois. But, well, we've made our choices to live here, haven't we? And then the last thing is to point out that more action is needed. I think you could make a case that if you look at this and someone is guiding you in the Virginia Citizens Defense League resolution that, yes, it sounds like there's going to be further action. But we don't know that something is required because they're talking about their intent to stop things in the future, but they are calling it a sanctuary at the same time. So I think that's bad in and of itself. But Publius, and I hadn't thought of actually including this in a resolution, should I had been uh, gotten into the work of drafting one, this has gone through my mind a little bit, but I actually hadn't thought of this. I think this is a great idea. She says, now, therefore, be it resolved by whatever county board of supervisors that the board intends to vigorously uphold the rights of their citizens of their county to be armed. And in addition thereto, intends at subsequent times and dates to adopt the following measures. And you could list all kinds of things in there. But it's putting them on the record that in the future, they must do more. No one is going to read this and think, well, our work here is done because we know that they intend to uh, change this. Funding for concealed weapons training. That's interesting. I wouldn't have thought of that. But that's interesting because the more that you foster an environment that is friendly to the right to keep and bear arms, the less fearful people are of them. That's why I support these so-called constitutional carry bills in states. Two, provisions to eliminate funding for enforcement of any pretended laws, regulations, judicial opinions, or other edicts which violate our declaration and any of the above described federal or state constitutional provisions. She leaves an open blank. And then four, other provisions as the board may deem necessary or appropriate for the purposes stated above. This is so straightforward. It covers all four essential principles that need to be done. I may flip a few words here and there, may include something else, but you could go ahead and push to get this introduced. And I would think this would be a big win to get something like this on the board if you believe that the right path forward is to pass a non-binding resolution. Now, th that's not always the right strategy, but it can be. And if you are on board with that and you want to kind of get along, especially because so many politicians these days like playing follow the leader and they see everybody else passing a resolution, they're, it, so they just copy the language from somebody else and they introduce it. They don't really know what they're talking about, it, but then they get the grandstand about it. And that's what I see happening in most of this effort these days. Now, Looking over at the live chat, Joshua Campbell says, introducing this 2A resolution to my county this Thursday. Hopefully you can grab the link to this. I will have this published on our website. You'll have a link to it in our show notes for this episode, probably about an hour or so after this episode is done. Should I give this to my county in Santa Clarita, says Austrian Watchman. Yeah, even if they don't pass it, even if you can find one person to introduce it, sometimes it takes years. You don't have to only work on introducing something because you think it'll pass. You introduce something because then it becomes kind of like a rallying flag. It's like you're carrying the torch. People will hear about it. They'll say, well, uh, you know, this is no none of these guys are going to vote for it. Or maybe you're going to find out someone's for it or against it. Someone you may think is in support of the right to keep and bear arms may be uninterested because it's too hardcore. And then you're going to learn a little bit more about them as well. Love Roscoe says, thank you so much. <laughs> Hashtag action, action, action. Or as our friends at LPMC say, take human action. Absolutely. Suzanne Sperry says, please tell us how that goes. Of course, on Thursday, uh, Essential Freedom says, I need to do this for Missouri. Clint Vick says, check the sheriff in your area. Mine is great. That is unusual. I would say one out of a thousand are probably great, if any. But that's awesome if you've got a good one in your area as well. And then just to sum it up here, 
This is what Publius tweeted about yesterday. I'm sorry it doesn't come up on the screen. I switched browsers recently. Maybe I can bring this down a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. There we go. She says, a suggested Second Amendment resolution for Virginia counties. I began with first principles and reason from there. But today, Americans go with their own opinions or what everybody says. See what reasoning from first principles looks like. And again, I will link to this in the show notes. I encourage you, if your county or city has not yet passed a so-called Second Amendment resolution, I would call it a right to keep and bear arms resolution, ask them to do this, because this will be a good starting point. And then recognize you're going to have a lot of work to do if you want to support the right to keep and bear arms in your area. I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope you found it educational. I hope it was at least interesting, fun to watch, whatever. If you support the show, please make sure to smash that like button. Continue leaving some comments, whether it's live or in the archives. I do read through all of them. I don't get a chance to respond to everybody. If you have some suggestions or ideas for future shows, feel free to email me, team at 10th Amendment Center.com. Again, that's all spelled out, team at 10th Amendment Center.com. And if you've been watching this show or reading our articles, we've got like 10,000 of them on our website, probably closer to 12,000 at this point, and you find the work that we do at the 10th Amendment Center good, worthy of support, educational, interesting, any of that, I would, I, I couldn't appreciate it more if you would consider join us as a member. It starts out as little as two bucks a month. I see a lot of people out in the live chat who are already members. Thank you to all of you. I couldn't thank you enough. Now, if you don't have the financial resources to kick in, I totally understand. I'm going to continue doing this for free no matter what, but I certainly do have to ask because we need the finances and the resources to keep pushing on and reaching more and more people. Again, I hope you found this interesting. I hope you learned something. I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.